Welcome. My name is Gary Adler. I'm the Director of Research for the Institute for Advanced Catholic Studies. I welcome you to tonight's event, The Muslim Catholic Connection, Faith, Fear, and the Future of America. Before we get started, I want to um, say a word of thanks to Father Lawrence. There he is. Father Lawrence. That's incredible. Father Lawrence, thanks for uh, letting us use your beautiful space here uh, and for uh, uh, welcoming, welcoming us uh, into this facility. Delighted to have you. Thank you. <laughs> and I also want to say thank you to um, Bob and Betty Plumley. They are the donors who have endowed this uh, series. Unfortunately, Betty passed away um, just in January of this year, um, so please uh, keep her uh, and particularly Bob at this time uh, in your prayers. We hope to see Bob maybe in the spring at the, uh, the next event, which we'll tell you about at, at the end of our evening together. Now, for those of you who are new to the Institute, what we do tonight is at the heart of who we are. We've had numerous conferences in the Holy Land, in Southern California, and we've published numerous books about interreligious dialogue. And tonight, we turn that phrase that can kind of seem abstract into a reality. You're not going to watch only, but you'll be participants in that. <coughs> now, in the book we have uh, for sale over there by uh, Ibu Patel, our speaker, he makes uh, what I think is a rather terrific claim. Right at the bottom of page 36, Ibu says, It is Catholic theology to build bridges with Muslims. What a statement to hear from a person who himself is not Catholic and who is interested to join with Catholics in doing that exact task. So it's a special night because we're building bridges, we're doing this together, and we've brought the right people here to help us in doing that. So let me tell you a little bit about the flow of the evening. We'll invite Ibu up here to give um, a few minutes of remarks. Um, if you have had a chance to read about him on the web or to get one of his books, that's terrific. If not, um, you'll get a little bit of the story of what he does and who he's about. And then after that, we're going to have a, a terrific panel uh, with Father Jim Heft and Ibu in dialogue, moderated by Dean Varun Soni. Um, before we begin, I want to um, tell you a little bit about the participants so you realize just how terrific it is that you're in this room tonight. Ibu Patel is the president of the Interfaith Youth Corps, which uh, I've read began from, from a $35,000 grant from the Ford Foundation. And his latest action for the Interfaith Youth Corps was spending this whole weekend with a group of students here in Southern California doing an interfaith training. He contributes to a wide range of publications, Washington Post, NPR, CNN. He's the author of three books. He was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford. And he's on the Department of Homeland Security's Faith-Based Advisory Council. In 2009, he was named one of America's best leaders by UN, uh, U.S. News and World Report. Let me mention a little bit about um, Father Heft and Dean Sony as well, so once we get going, we can really get going. Father Jim Heft is the president of the Institute for Advanced Catholic Studies. He's been here since 2006. He's also the Alton M. Brooks President of Religion. He's a priest in the Society of Mary, which is establishing a community just up the street from here. Author or editor of 11 books. And in 2011, he won the Theodore Hesburgh Award for Distinguished Service in Catholic Higher Education. And Varun Soni. Varun, as I mentioned, is the Dean of Religious Life. He's a university fellow at USC Annenberg Center on Public Diplomacy. He contributes to the Washington Post, New Indian Express, Harvard Divinity Bulletin, among other publications. He has a terrific book on prophetic mystics that's, that includes Bob Marley. He has a graphic novel. Um, and I've learned that he's the most degreed person here. An MTS from Harvard Divinity, a JD from UCLA, and a PhD from University of Cape Town. And I actually think I might be forgetting a degree or two in there. And he recently admitted to me that he um, may be working on a book of sport as religion, which would require him to, to do the awful field work of going to things such as the World Cup and the Olympics and that nasty sort of research. 
so we'll see. So before we keep going, just a reminder, if you have anything that, uh, that buzzes, makes noises, take that out of your pocket and turn it off now. And then it is truly my great pleasure, uh, pleasure to invite to the podium Ibu Patel. Thank you. So um, I have to say that I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm tempted to tell you uh, the opening line that I used when I was speaking at the Naval Academy a couple of years ago uh, because there's, uh, there's a, a thread of the same feeling of unease as I stand up here. Uh, the, I was staring out at probably 400 midshipmen, steely-faced young men and women, and I said, you know, when I told my father, a Muslim immigrant from India, that I was coming to speak at the Naval Academy, he squared me straight with focused eyes and he set his jaw and he said, you tell them we are different from them. <laughs> we are Notre Dame fans. <laughs> <laughs> I must say, I mean, you laughed a lot faster than those guys did. There was, you know, like a moment of like, thought I was gonna be walking the plank, you know? <laughs> At some, some commandant, I think, like, nodded his head and everybody could titter in the audience. But, but uh, I don't think the, the challenge here is going to be Muslims and Catholics. I think the challenge might be Trojans and fighting Irish, but we will f we'll make our way through that. Um, I also want to say to Dean Sony, um, as a fellow Desi, you might have a lot of degrees, but do you have an MD? Yes. <laughs> the other Desis in the audience get that. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I have the highest regard for uh, what you guys have done with your religious life on this campus. I've known Father Heft for some years now, um, uh, followed his work, uh, spoke with him at, at Dominican University. Uh, I'm thrilled that he has chosen a, a path that is no longer in the senior levels of, of university administration, but is instead kind of uh, illuminating ways that people who orient around religion differently can work together, uh, which I you know, said in the video earlier that I think is, is one of the essential issues of the 21st century. And Dean Sony and his staff are building what I, am, I learn every time that I come here. I think this is the third or fourth year I've been here in a row that you know, may be the most uh, impressive of any university uh, interreligious, both student life and intellectual complex that, that I, at least I can think of. So congratulations to all of that. And thank you so much for inviting me here to be with you. So I want to... Um, Take you back a couple of years. If people remember the summer of 2010, um, it was uh, from, from mid-June to about mid-September, you couldn't get what became known as the Ground Zero Mosque off of your television, right? Uh, and it was uh, originally, originally titled Cordoba House, but what was effectively the idea of, of a Muslim YMCA in lower Manhattan, a couple of blocks from uh, the the horror of the, the terrorist attacks of 9-11 uh, became a, a major issue in American public life. Uh, and Sacred Ground, the, the book that's on that table, is, is in part about that summer and what made up that kind of flammable moment. But as, as I was doing research for the book, I found something out that uh, was, was striking to me. Um, a couple of blocks from where Cordoba House was, was meant to be, and, and there's a version of it now running, but it's much more low-key than the originally planned multi-story center. Uh, a couple of blocks from there, uh, a Catholic church called St. Peter's in the mid to late 18th century was dramatically opposed. Took uh, many years, actually, for that church to get established. When it finally did get established in the late 1700s, the forces opposing that church required it to move outside of the city limits. At that time, the city limits uh, didn't extend all the way to the tip of the island in Manhattan. And there were demonstrations and riots outside of the church all the time. In fact, one particular demonstration took place on a day that the opponents called the Day of Papist Superstition. Dozens of people were injured. One person was killed. The day was otherwise known as Christmas Mass. So an in, in interesting beginning for me in the research process, right, to, to discover that just a couple of blocks from where this, this Muslim group wanted to establish a center that was not primarily for its own use, but primarily for the benefit of the larger community, 
there was a, a Catholic church that met a, a similar kind of firestorm a couple of centuries earlier. So I started doing research on anti-Catholic prejudice in American life. And it's actually a fascinating story. Uh, the great historian Arthur Schlesinger Jr. says, the deepest bias in the American people is the bias against Catholics. I want you to think about that for a second, right? The deepest bias in the American people is the bias against Catholics. Now, he said this some decades back. And we can argue about where anti-Catholicism sits with us today. But there are many communities in the United States, African Americans, Native Americans, women, LGBT folks, who would have a shot at that crown most prejudiced against. But the fact that a historian of Schlesinger's caliber says it belongs to Catholics, I think is interesting. And so I started to look deeper and deeper into this, right? In 1854, the Know Nothing Party, anybody here know who the Know Nothing Party is? Right. Um, single plank in its platform that Catholics don't belong in the United States elected 75 people to the U.S. Congress. And by the way, Congress was significantly smaller then because of the, uh, uh, of the U.S. population being smaller. Entire state legislatures, including in Massachusetts, were made up of know-nothing politicians. Many of them didn't even appear on the ballot. They got written in and defeated candidates that were on the ballots and that had been campaigning for months. Right? Abraham Lincoln says of the Know Nothing Party that our progress in degeneracy seems to me to be pretty complete. <laughs> we begin by saying all men are created equal, and then we say all men are created equal except for black people, and now we are going to say all men are created equal except for black people, immigrants, and Catholics. As people here know, uh, the Ku Klux Klan emerges in the early 20th century in a way as kind of uh, a, a more updated version of the Know Nothing Party, and their particular target is, is Catholics. The Ku Klux Klan, amongst other forces in American life in 1928, scuttles the presidential candidacy of Al Smith. And in, in 30 to 40 years later, in the late 1950s, as another young senator from the East begins to consider a presidential run, that is, of course, John F. Kennedy, the anti-Catholic forces start to array again. Here's the remarkable thing about those forces in 1958 and 1959, just how mainstream they were. So, Billy Graham, perhaps the single most influential and important American Protestant of the 20th century, starts to correspond with Richard Nixon, Kennedy's opponent in the 1960 election, and says things like, I, I beseech you to bring up the subject of Kennedy's Catholicism because we live at an uncertain hour in our history. Right. Billy Graham sends a letter to his two, the two million people on his mailing list calling for those people to organize Sunday school classes against Catholicism and against the Kennedy candidacy and a turn out the vote campaign against Kennedy. Runs a conference in Europe that becomes the precursor conference to what becomes known as the famous Peel Conference in the United States, which is a conference of the major evangelical forces in the United States, basically a full-throated anti-Catholic, we have to stop Kennedy before he plants the flag of the Pope at the White House. This is 50 years ago. This is living memory, right? Of course, the classic thing is that uh, uh, one of his, uh, his, uh, his Kennedy speechwriters said, I don't think I've ever heard Jack Kennedy talk about his religion. And Jackie <laughs> Kennedy said, but Jack's not really a Catholic at all. <laughs> So if there was somebody who was going to plant the flag of Catholicism on, uh, at the White House, it wasn't going to be John F. Kennedy. But still, this history, of course, starts to, it, it, it strikes me, and, and then something occurs to me as well, that the arguments that are arrayed against Catholicism in the past are almost the exact same arguments arrayed against Muslims today. So for example, in the past, look at what happened. Catholics do in other countries. And specifically, there's references to Spain and Italy and the role of the Catholic Church in, in the uh, fascist movements in those countries. And the point is, if Catholics 
move into the White House in America, they will bring those same politics. The exact same argument arrayed against Muslims today. Look at what Muslims do in other countries, and they will bring those same policies and politics and ways of being here. Second, Catholicism and every Catholic institution is a Trojan horse carrying popery inside. These are literal statements from people, right? Sharia law is a tro the presence of Muslims in America and any institution they set up, mosque, school, YMCA, is a Trojan horse bearing Sharia inside. My favorite comparison is, have people heard about uh, the, the concerns that folks have about taqiyya? Most Muslims, when they hear that there's a concern about taqiyya, have to look it up because they've never heard of what taqiyya is. <laughs> it's a minor Muslim practice used largely by Shias, which is called dissimulation, right? What is it? That honesty in Islam is considered so important that there actually had to be a Muslim tenet that said that if, if, your, if, if your life is under threat because of your religion, you are allowed to dissimulate. You are allowed to practice taqiyya. In other words, you are allowed to say you are not Muslim, right? I want to repeat that. Honesty in Islam is considered so important that Muslims were dying because they refused to lie about their faith or their practice. And so this theological thread comes into play saying you are allowed in order to protect your life and your family's life and your community's life to dissimulate, to practice taqiyya. By the way, quiz for the Catholics in the audience. Who knows which Catholic practice is an analog to, to Muslim taqiyya which anti-Catholic forces said, when Catholics say something, they're lying and they're practicing mental reservation. And so if you go back and look at the anti-Catholic speeches and writings of the mid 20th century and earlier, you will hear people say, Catholics will tell you, to. Do, John F. Kennedy is telling you that he is not gonna bring the Pope into the White House, but what he's really doing is practicing mental reservation. It's the same charge as Thakia. So I'm reading, 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 right? Uh, Mark Massa and others who are who, scholars who are writing about this. And, and the thing that's starting to get me is, is people were opposing Catholic schools, Catholic universities, Catholic hospitals. And at one point I kind of stood up straight and I thought to myself, what would have happened if the anti-Catholic forces had won? What would have happened if Abe Lincoln didn't oppose the Know Nothing Party? What would have happened if the Ku Klux Klan took energy from the defeat of Al Smith in 1928 and actually grew its influence? Well, I'll tell you one small thing. My family wouldn't be here because it's Notre Dame University that brought my family here. My wife wouldn't be a civil rights attorney because it's Loyola Law School where she went. My sister-in-law wouldn't be running a, fa a foundation in Chicago that gives uh, money to arts and education groups because she was educated at Loyola University. My kids wouldn't have gone to preschool because it's a Catholic preschool that my kids went to. And it's not just my family. American civil society is literally unrecognizable minus the Catholic contribution. There are some 600 Catholic hospitals in the United States. That number might be a little bit different now with consolidations and the like, but about 15 to 20% of American patients on any given day, Catholic hospital. 230 Catholic universities. 7,000 Catholic grade schools and high schools. I think to myself, in, I, I live on the northwest side of Chicago. Within five square miles, or probably a dozen Catholic schools. What does that mean? That means that if the Catholic schools didn't exist, and probably a, a third to a half of the students at those schools are non-Catholic. If those schools didn't exist, the public school system would be totally overwhelmed. American society relies on the contributions of the Catholic community. I think to myself, this is the genius of America, right? That different faith groups from all over the world are allowed to bring the seeds of their inspiration, plant them in American soil, 
and give rise to institutions that express their theology and serve the common good. I'm going to say that again. Right? The genius of American society is its openness to people from a range of traditions and all around the world, bringing the seeds of their inspiration, Catholic, Evangelical, Hindu, Muslim, Jewish, Baha'i, Sikh, secular humanist, planting those seeds in American soil and giving rise to institutions that do not just serve their own community, but that serve the common good. Robert Putnam at Harvard University, the guy who invents the term social capital, says at least 50% of American social capital is religiously driven. At least. And actually, when it comes to philanthropy, it's closer to 75%. I'm going to repeat. American civil society is unrecognizable without the contributions of its religious communities, and especially the Catholic community. That actually made me a little bit sad when it came to thinking about Cordoba House or the Ground Zero Mosque, because at the end of the day, that wasn't a place for prayer for Muslims. That was Muslims walking the Catholic path in America. That was Muslims finally having critical mass in the United States, as far as immigrants goes, finally having two to three generations on American soil saying, you know what, as much as we care about the countries in which our grandfathers were born, our future is the nation in which our children will be buried, and that is America. And it is time to practice the Muslim theology of maslaha, the common good, to invest in this country, to plant our seeds here and not give rise to institutions that only serve ourselves, but instead that serve the public good. And there are literally Muslim imams who preach khutbas who say, you all were educated at Catholic schools. You all gave birth to your children in Catholic hospitals. What are you giving back to America? When will a child be born in a Muslim hospital in this country? When will an addict be counseled out of his addiction, primarily because of a Muslim social services center? When will a Muslim disaster relief agency come to the side of an earthquake victim, as Catholic social services do, does? It was the Catholic path that we were seeking to walk by building Cordoba House. America changes. 2010, that same summer of Cordoba House, Robert Putnam and David Campbell published one of the 10 most important books in American religion of the past quarter century, a book called American Grace. And they look at Schlesinger's line that the deepest bias in the American people is the bias against Catholics. And they say, my gosh, America has changed in the last 60 years. The three most favorably viewed groups, religious groups in America in 2006 and 2007 in the most comprehensive survey of religious attitudes done yet in the United States, mainline Protestants, no surprise there, Jews and Catholics. A stunning fact, a stunning fact, right? That just 60 years ago, the most mainstream and influential evangelical ministers in America were saying that Jack Kennedy, a man who nobody really mistook as a particularly uh, observant Catholic, was going to plant the flag of the Pope in the White House. 60 years later, Catholics being a dramatically respected group in the United States. Six justices on the Supreme Court. But it's actually not entirely accurate to say America changes, because no nation changes of its own accord. Martin Luther King Jr. loved to say, the pendulum doesn't swing, people push it. People changed America. After 1928, an organization called the NCCJ, the National Conference of Christians and Jews, was formed because a group of people in the United States, including Protestant ministers who didn't have a direct uh, di anything direct at stake said, look, we can't have a deep prejudice on American soil, right? What happened to Al Smith is deeply anti-American. It's people who push the pendulum from religious prejudice to a sense of religious welcoming, who, if you will, tilled and fertilized the soil so that Catholic institutions could grow even stronger 
and serve an even wider group of people. I think that that's the challenge for us today. What do we do when we see the prejudices around us? Whether it's against Muslims, whether it's against the LGBT community, whether it's against Mormons or secular humanists. I think that that prejudice has, there's two great sins attached to it. One is the sin of violating another identity or community. Second is the sin of building a barrier to their contribution. What if that group of French Catholics wasn't allowed to build Notre Dame in the early 19th century? You guys would have had a much better football record. Think about that. Right? that this guy didn't find that funny at all. America is based on the contributions of its citizens. I'll end with this story. It's President's Day, and um, George Washington was actually prescient about this. Uh, the leader of the first national institution in America, right? The Continental Army. And when he finds out that, that people in the army are having what's called Pope's Day observances where they burn the Pope in effigy, he writes his generals and he says, to, at this moment when we are becoming a nation, to insult the religion of your fellow soldiers and one day citizens is so stupid to be called monstrous. What's the next chapter in that American journey? What's the next chapter? Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming. It's really a great turnout on President's Day. And i um, so blessed to be here moderating this very important conversation. Uh, I'm pretty sure that I'm older than Ibu, but I always look at him as an older brother anyway, because he's really been such an important and critical voice in national interfaith leadership and conversation. Uh, he's in, mentored a generation of new interfaith leaders uh, at every level in every sector of American society. So, Ibu, thank you so much for being here today. And I'm so grateful to also join um, Father Jim Haft, friend, mentor, colleague. The work he's doing at USC is extraordinary in terms of the Institute for Advanced Catholic Studies, a place that brings together scholars and practitioners, civic leaders, business leaders, and other policymakers to think about how our faith traditions in the plural can be a solution to the world's great crises and not part of the problem. So thank you, Jim, for all the work that you do as well. Uh, the format of the, today's evening will be, um, uh, I will sort of moderate a conversation for the first half and then we'll open it up for a Q&A with all of you. And then uh, we'll do a book signing uh, and sale. I really urge you to pick up Sacred Ground. It, it's an extraordinary exposition on the state of religious pluralism today. Some of what you heard uh, earlier from Ibu uh, is actually um, outlined in greater depth in the book. So really uh, encourage all of you to pick up a copy. But before I begin this conversation, Jim, I wanted to give you an opportunity perhaps to share a few reactions about uh, Ibu's opening comments, uh, particularly in regard to anti-Catholic sentiments and uh, Islamophobia. Uh, the comments that Ibu made about the anti-Catholicism are, uh, I think, are probably a surprise because very few of us have a sense of history. It once was said that Catholics have a great sense of tradition but not much of a sense of history. <laughs> and if that were the case, uh, nothing that Ibu reported would be a surprise. In my own university in Dayton in 1928, the campus was bombed several times by the Ku Klux Klan. Now, this happened on many campuses. We are told that the response was not exactly a model for interreligious dialogue. A group of the students, uh, the guys, grabbed baseball bats and chased them off the campus. <laughs> but the, the kind of prejudice that uh, Catholics went through is very, very pronounced. And it can still be the case, though what Ibu said is true, and that is the kind of what they call the warmth survey in mm -hmm. sociology which gives an indication of how people feel about groups, put 
uh, Catholics and Jews really at the very top today. At the bottom, Muslims and Mormons. They still were occupying the lower left-hand quadrant. So I think what he says is very important. Now, things have been exacerbated, made much worse by 9-11. And they're also made much worse by what's going on in the Middle East and the coverage that comes. But I don't think you have to be uh, highly informed to realize that Muslims kill more Muslims than they kill anybody else. And you might say, well, how barbaric. I would ask you just to think, go back 160 years. In this country, Christians versus Christians to the number of about 750,000 killed each other. In other words, history gives a certain perspective here. The war between the South and the North, the vast majority of people involved in that were Christians. And the estimate of historians is about 750,000 people were killed in those fights. So we all have problems in our traditions, and we also have opportunities. And the thing that I think Ibu said eloquently this evening is to underscore the need for a fresh look at what unfortunately is an old problem. I want to start our conversation um, really with something that's at the heart of everything that the three of us do, which is interfaith in some capacity or another, whether it be advocacy, research, scholarship, um, uh, community service, etc. And we always talk to our students, uh, and what we've noticed about our students is unlike previous generations, they're not threatened by other people's faiths. In fact, when they encounter another faith, it helps them edify their own faith tradition. So given that tonight's um, event is about Catholic Muslim engagement, I want to ask each of you about your encounters with each other's faiths. And I know, Ibu, you've talked eloquently about Dorothy Day as being an example, and of course, uh, you know, we won't hold your Notre Dame allegiance against you here because you're a guest. Uh, and of course, uh, Jim Haft, uh, when you were at the uh, University of Dayton, you actively recruited Muslim students to your campus, and that's a great legacy that continues to this day. So you've all, you both had encounters with other faith, with each other's faith tradition, and how has that helped you appreciate aspects of your own? So, I mean, the, probably the, the two most formative uh, mentors that I had, one was a, a mentorship from beyond the grave, and one was a mentorship when I was just beginning in interfaith work with Catholic. And uh, um, uh, when I was in college, I was very involved in social justice work, but I, I was involved in it from uh, the fuel of anger instead of from the fuel of love. And after about 18 months, two years of that, I just I felt burned out. Uh, I didn't I didn't want to I didn't want to just be angry at the system. I wanted to be um, a part of uh, of a new world. And uh, somebody mentioned to me. It must have been an angel. I mean, I think about it now, but somebody said, you know, you ever heard of Dorothy Day? And I said, no. And she said, do you know, you know about the Catholic worker movement? And I said, no. And I'm like, uh, tell me about it. And she said, well, you gotta go there to know. And it turns out that there was a Catholic worker house of hospitality in Champaign-Urbana where I was a student at the University of Illinois. And I went there on a random Sunday. They didn't tell anybody I was going. I showed up there uh, early Sunday evening and I was kind of confused at first because I volunteered at a bunch of different social service agencies and I was like, you know, where's the intake desk, right? Where's the person telling me to fill out the form for, for insurance purposes? Where's the, where's the lobby in the waiting room? Like, where's the staff? And um, all I heard were a, a group of kids playing in the living room and I smelled good things coming from the kitchen and the first thing anybody said to me was, are you staying for dinner? And I'm like, heck yeah, I'm staying for me. My mama didn't raise no fool. <laughs> and so I'm having what feels like an unbelievably normal dinner, heavy on the lentils, I might say. Uh, and I, I'm thinking to myself, I, I, I'm not getting this, right? And so I find, I'm like, somebody tell me how this works. And people were just so natural about this. You know, what, there was a family there, it was a a migrant worker family working in the uh, fields around Champaign-Urbana. They were from Mexico. They were staying there to save up money for a deposit on, on an apartment. Uh, there were several uh, people who had been grad students at the University of Illinois who had deepened into their Christian faith and decided that what that meant was living the way of Jesus. And they had moved into this community. I was, I was just stunned. Uh, somebody said, you know, 
Jesus gave up his privilege to live in solidarity and friendship with the poor. That's why we do this. I was like, I've like listened to mounds upon mounds of sociology lectures about privilege, but I know of nobody who gave up their privilege voluntarily to live in solidarity with the poor. And somebody was like, well, if you believe in God and follow Jesus, this is what you do. And I was, I was so taken by that approach, right? That simple approach of, of we live as Jesus tried to live. Without fanfare, without parades, that's how we live. That I spent a summer in Catholic worker houses after that. You can imagine how my parents felt about that, right? <laughs> um, but up and down the eastern seaboard, Atlanta to Boston, I, I wanted to be around people who honestly, who weren't hypocrites. Right? Like I was done with social analysis that, that wasn't put into action. And the thing that I loved about Catholic workers and the, the story and work of Dorothy Day was that she, once she discovered a theological truth, she lived it. Again, without fanfare, without parades, she just lived it. I was so moved by that. Uh, and then the second person who had a profound influence on me was a man named Brother Wayne Teasdale, who I write about, I write about both of these in my first book, Acts of Faith. Mm -hmm. And um, Brother Wayne was this Catholic monk in Chicago who had taken vows with Father B. Griffiths, who was a Benedictine monk who had moved to India from England and started a community called Shanti Vanam. And, and Brother Wayne had found Father, had found Father B. and gone and taken vows with him. And uh, he, would, he would bring me to the events that he would speak at, at the Jain temple in Bartlett and at Hindu temples. He was, he was a scholar of Hinduism who taught at Catholic Theological Union. And he would give a speech and then he would beckon me up to the stage and he would whisper in my ear, tell them about the interfaith youth movement. <laughs> and I would whisper in his ear, there is no interfaith youth movement. <laughs> <laughs> and then he would look at me as if like, just talk about it. 15 years later, you know, there's an interfaith youth movement. <laughs> Right? Uh, and there was this, that's how it started, by this crazy Catholic monk who took me to his speeches and who he'd say, come meditate with me. And I'd go down to see to you in his little studio if we'd meditate. And then the alarm clock, the ticking of the alarm clock would bother him. And so I would hear him like swear under his breath <laughs> and get up and do something with it. And then when the meditation ended, I would see him retrieve the alarm clock from the freezer. <laughs> it was the first place he could think of to put it, right? But this is why I this is this is why I'm a Muslim, and this is why I do what I do because of these two Catholics. There are four steps in my awakening. The first was the family I was born into. Uh, my mother was Catholic. My father was Protestant, and my father both were raised on farms. I won't go into the details, but my um, they moved to Cleveland, and my, guy, my dad got a job working for a Jew by the name of Max Friedman, who was wonderful. So as a child, I'm, I'm a triangulating, you know, trying to figure out how this, and, and, and I had one teacher in grade school that said out loud, if, if you're not Catholic, you won't go to heaven. And I was very close to my father, and I stood up and I yelled at her. I said, that's not, that's not true, it won't happen. My daddy's gone to heaven. Step two, as a young religious in college, I began studying, among other things, the history of the Catholic Church's treatment of Jews. Extremely painful. It was a sobering moment. And these are histories that weren't grinding an ax. They were telling the story, documented. And of course, it reached its peak point of violence in World War II. Absolutely shameful. And it forced the Christian community, both Protestant and Catholic, to do an examination of conscience and begin to clean up the act. Third, at University of Dayton, I occupied a position as the number two person. We had a big research institute, I hired all kinds of people, including Protestants, Catholics, Muslims, Jews, agnostics, atheists. And we had a preponderance of Catholic and Christians and intellectuals, but at the same time, at that university, like at many Catholic universities, there was a desire to keep the circle open. To have a circle, but to keep it open. 
Ibu's had a good deal of experience with Catholic universities. I certainly have. And the belief is that welcoming others doesn't mean that you're going to end up being a syncretist, which means you just kind of lose everything and blend everything in a stew. There has to be distinctiveness. And the deeper the distinctiveness, the more flexible it is. It's like a tree. If, if the roots are deep, it can take a lot more flex and so on. So that was a great experience for me. And I, I talked in depth with Muslims, Jews, Hindus. And, and as Ibu said, in recent years, the University of Dayton has welcomed quite a few Muslim mm -hmm. students. And I think Muslim students are drawn to Catholic institutions, mm -hmm. not only because they're accepted, uh, but there's a way in which there can be a real dialogue. And we may get into that in a minute. Let me move to the last one, the fourth one. I was already interested in interreligious dialogue, and that was 9-11. When 9-11 happened, I said, oh my god, I, I got to start thinking about this. And I remember Franklin Graham, the son of Billy Graham, writing an article that appeared in the Dayton Daily News, where I was, denouncing Islam as the religion of the devil. The religion of the devil. I know evil when I see it. And what happened in 9-11 was evil. It was violent, and it should be condemned. At the same time, that type of sweeping judgment uh, is not well-grounded in any history or first-hand experience with Muslims. So I wrote an article and countered it. But I made the, the promise right at that point, I've got to start becoming more of a student <clears throat> in understanding Islam. So my regret is, the only re you only have one life, folks. My regret is that I haven't really had the same degree of exposure and commitment to Asian religions. But I'm depending on Varun to provide that nice. for me. Thank you. <laughs> well, as a Hindu, I would challenge that we only have one life, so. <laughs> Um, this is like a setup for a good joke. A Christian, a Muslim, and a Hindu are on a stage together. Part of today's um, theme for the event is the future. And I want to talk a little bit about the future of interfaith. I think the evolution of interfaith has gone from interfaith dialogue, what we saw maybe 20 years ago, to interfaith action, which I think is what we're seeing now on university campuses, to interfaith study, which I think is what we're gonna see in the future. And increasingly our students wanna get, get graduate degrees in interfaith studies, whatever that might mean. We have a, a young woman right here, Sable, uh, who's doing her PhD at USC on interfaith in higher education. And I think we're gonna see more and more of this. I know both of you have been involved in conversations to think about what does interfaith studies look like at a university campus? And how can we integrate the co-curricular with the curricular in terms of providing an integrative, holistic experience for students? So your thoughts, both of you, on what does interfaith studies look like uh, on a research campus? And uh, what are some of the challenges and possibilities? Do you want me to go first? Or? Uh, let me take a first shot at it. Uh, I uh, attended a, a conference that Ibu had organized in New York. And there were a lot of people there that were very much committed to trying to create this uh, undergraduate interfaith kind of thing. And a lot of it was focused in, in a very good way on trying to understand the other as the other. Uh, it was also uh, trying to create empathy for someone who's not like you. I mean, this is, someone said to me, a definition of marriage. <laughs> That's a bad joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know anything about that. Uh, and, 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 uh, but I think one of the great challenges we have is this. It is to appreciate another faith in the terms of the people who believe that faith and not make them first an object of conversion. Though one of the challenges for both Islam and Christianity is they are religions that have missionary zeal in a way that, in fact, Jews do not. So at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, it says, go forth and baptize all nations in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All nations, all right? To wrestle with religious pluralism, to respect the difference, and remain faithful to your own tradition without watering it down, 
That is, to me, one of the major challenges of our age, and to figure out how to do that. Because what usually happens is either we are faithful to our own tradition and we condemn the others because they're really, either they're evil, as Franklin Graham said, or worse, or we simply say, hey, we're all basically the same. You know, so why can't we just get along? I want to get along. I want to recognize where there is overlap. I want to recognize the number of the key things we have in common, and Muslims and Christians do. But I also want to remain faithful to what I think is a great gift of the gospel for me as a Christian, Jesus Christ. So how you work that out, mm -hmm. I think, is one of the great challenges. And it's one of the things I admire about Ibu's work is that it isn't uh, an effort to try to make all people into a kind of new religion where basically differences don't count. And I respect that. So let me, let me address what Father Heft said and answer uh, Dean Sony's question in kind of two different categories, right? So the, the first thing I want to say is, is um, I'll tell a quick story. So uh, I have a good friend named Scott Alexander, who's a professor of Muslim Catholic studies at Catholic Theological Union, which is a seminary, right? A seminary that, as, uh, amongst other things, trains priests. And every year or so, he will have an audience with uh, the Archbishop, now the Cardinal of Chicago, Cardinal George. And they'll have 30 or 60 minutes together, and Cardinal George always begins the conversation with this line. Professor Alexander, you do know that it is a, that it is a legitimate activity for Catholics to attempt to convert Muslims. Yes, Cardinal. And then they'll spend the next 59 minutes discussing the cooperation activities that Scott is organizing through the Muslim Catholic Studies program. Right? And I... I actually think it's Catholics that have worked this out as well and better than anybody, right? The primary purpose of Catholic hospitals in the United States is not to convert people to Catholicism. It is a different expression of the gospel. Now, that doesn't mean that if you were to walk in, have open heart surgery, get healed, and have a conversion moment, that there wouldn't be somebody there who were to, well, to facilitate that. It just means that the primary purpose of the hospital isn't for that to happen, right? The primary purpose of St. Matthias School, where my older son went to preschool, and St. Ben's, where my younger son goes to preschool, isn't to convert them, right? Now, I'm sure that if, if my wife and I were to start to come to Mass, uh, they would welcome that. Khalil, my younger son, badly wanted to uh, partake in the Knights of Columbus put the Christ back in Christmas poster contest. <laughs> we had a theological moment about that, I will tell you. <laughs> But the point that I'm making is that, is that I, think, I think when Fa Father Heft elevates this to the level of intellectual quandary, which I think is important, and the fact is it works out in practice pretty often in large part because Catholics have set the example. And people will say, oh, that's just in America. I mean, are you kidding? You know, if you're middle class in South Asia or the Middle East, you go to a Catholic school. And, and it's not, and, and 850 million Hindus aren't trying to get their kids into Catholic schools in India to convert them to Catholicism, right? At the same time, they realize that there is a, an expression of holiness to that Catholic institution. What, what is all this to mean? That there are different expressions of a religious tradition. And one legitimate expression is conversion, and another expression is cooperation. And, and frankly, everybody does this. I think Catholics do this better than, than anybody else, but evangelicals do this as well, right? I mean, how do you have an organization like World Vision working in countries like Pakistan, Afghanistan, etc., unless they effectively have a firewall between their service activities and their conversion activities, right? So um, do you want to respond to that? And then I want to respond more directly to, to Varun's question about interfaith studies. Okay, just one quick yeah. uh, response. Uh, there was an interview with the Pope an atheist had written a letter saying, this is Pope, Pope Francis, that, that I uh, gave him some advice on how to be Pope and what he should be doing, and uh, that he would like to talk with the Pope. Well, the Pope, you know, cold called him and said, let's talk. And they came and they had this interview. And then afterwards, this atheist kind of wrote up the interview. And it was kind of questionable whether he was a little selective in what he wrote and so on. But there was one exchange, and let's, let's assume this was close to accurate, where uh, the atheist said, you know, my friend said I shouldn't come and see and talk with you because if I do, you're going to try to convert me. And the Pope said, in response, supposedly, he said, conversion, I believe proselytism is nonsense. 
I don't believe in proselytizing. What I really want to know is get to know you as a person. And I thought to myself, exactly. That's a wonderful way to work at conversion. <laughs> Very clever. Very clever. Which is to say, basically, when people come at you in your face, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? It's almost a, 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 not only a conversation stopper, it's just over. It's over. So on the other hand, if there's something at the center of my life which gives me joy, I don't know how to cap it. And when the document in uh, Vatican II about religious freedom, it says, very importantly, no coercion in matters of religion. There should be no coercion ever. And that needs to be respected, not just as an overall schema, but interpersonally. Right. You know, Father Huff and I were talking earlier that you know, pe people come to the Catholic tradition. I mean, I, it's, it's very interesting to, to note the number of intellectual evangelicals who have converted to Catholicism oh, over the last 20 or 30 years especially, right? Uh, some of the most... Um, Fa Father uh, Richard John Newhouse, uh, who, who was the editor-in-chief of First Things, you know, probably the most prominent intellectual religion journal in America when he was editor of it, was a con convert from, evangel from the, from the okay. evangelical tradition. And I, it, it's, it's not because uh, a priest is knocking at their door seeking to convert them. It's because 2,000 years of intellectual, theological reflection and holiness is going to draw people if it is if 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 it if it's able to breathe. It's and there's also two thousand years of sin and prejudice and bigotry, that is also part of our history. So sometimes that sign is ambiguous. Um, let's let's uh, let me let me respond directly to to uh, Varun's question about interfaith studies. So this is what we at Interfaith Youth Corps are kind of geeking out about most recently. So you will have to uh, forgive me if I like start to get grad school on this. Uh, um, so here's how we define interfaith studies is, is it's uh, inquiry, research, teaching, and practice in how people and communities who orient around religion differently interact with one another. Okay, so basically what we're saying is that the interaction between people who orient around religion differently is such an important reality in human affairs today that it deserves its own subfield and it ought to be an interdisciplinary subfield. So Father Heft articulated what I would say, oh, how a theologian and a comparative religion scholar would approach inter, would, 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 where they would sit in an interfaith studies department. A theologian would say, how do I be fully myself, fully Catholic and fully with you? Right? That's a very interesting and important theological question. A comparative religion scholar would say, how do I understand you on your own terms? Right? Uh, but there are a whole range of other disciplines that would approach interfaith studies, including some, uh, some surprising ones. So for example, a historian would say, what are moments in history in which religious groups have interacted terribly and moments that they've interacted positively, and are there any lessons we can draw from that, right? And then, of course, there, there are, there are uh, tributaries from all of these. An economic historian might say, what, what did the economy have to do with that? A political scientist might ask, under what governmental arrangements does religious diversity thrive and turn into cooperation, and under what governmental arrangements does it tend to turn into conflict? Uh, uh, a political theorist like a, a Michael Walzer or a Michael Sandel or a John Courtney Murray uh, might ask the question, how do you have m multiple universal creeds within the same political entity, right? So these are all kind of obvious, right? A sociologist might say, uh, what, let's, do, let's, let's, let's do surveys of the attitudes of people of of, of, of people from one religion about other religions, which is precisely what Putnam and Campbell did in American Grace. But I think it gets more fun, right? In other words, it gets, starts to get counterintuitive. Uh, we're starting to learn from neuroscience. I understand you have a neuroscience program coming up here, but we're starting to learn from neuroscience how our quote-unquote moral machinery works in a tribal way. Why is it that, why is it that we are immediately attracted to like identity groups. What does that mean 
for our kind of instinctive understanding to non-like identity groups, right? So my doctorate is actually in a department of education and there was almost nobody in that department who got their doctorate in a department of education. There were historians, there were philosophers, there were sociologists, there was a guy uh, from geography, and of course there were people in teaching and curriculum, right? But what happened is that people decided that the phenomenon of education, formal schooling, was important enough to deserve its own subfield. And a part of that subfield was purely academic. It was to illuminate. A part of the subfield is normative, which is to say it's, it has particular goals. I think interfaith studies is the same thing. A part of it is just academic. It's simply to illuminate, right? And, and the person writing that has, has no particular civic or social goal in mind. But then a part of it is normative. And, and the people on that side of the department, just like if you're in public health, right, or if you're in uh, education, you actually want schools to be better. You actually want there to be less disease. So on the normative side, side of interfaith studies, you would want there to be more cooperation and less conflict. And I, you know, I see uh, in the next 10 or 15, right now, NYU has a minor in interfaith leadership. Nazareth College has a minor. I see in the next 10 or 15 years, there, there are 50 minors across the United States, and there's five to 10 uh, uh, graduate programs. Now these will be a varying quality, Right, but I, I think that we are on the, I think we're on the path towards a bona fide subfield. I'm gonna ask one more question and then we'll open it up for Q&A. And so um, I'll ask that you keep your answer short here. But this is a question about uh, American religion in general. Um, in 1952, 2% of Americans were not formally affiliated with any religious tradition. In 1997, 7% of Americans were not formally affiliated. Uh, today, 20% of Americans are not formally affiliated with any religious tradition. And amongst students, our students, those under 30, almost 40% of those under 30 in the United States are not formally affiliated with any religious tradition. And what, what, what we see, though, is um, that these people who are not formally affiliated haven't lost faith in God or in their own spiritual journeys. They're just disaffiliating from institutional religion. There's a movement from institutional religion to, I think, individual religion. Uh, we live in a country where religious leadership means different things now. We live in a country where Oprah Winfrey is arguably the sort of most famous spiritual leader of the country, where I've argued organized sports is actually displacing organized religion in many ways. So in your own experiences, thinking about religion in the public sphere, religion in America, how are people finding God, faith, translating their beliefs into action as they move from a formal affiliation to formal disaffiliation? <laughs> so Varun said keep it short. Uh, so um, I, I, think that, I think that there's a larger macro trend that this is under, which is the deinstitutionalization of American society, right? So in other areas, of, areas in America, whether you want it to or not, you have to get up, put your suit on, and go to church at 9 a.m. on Sunday. Now you don't. There, there, there just isn't social pressure in the same way. So, so this, uh, so some sociologists say this is this is, um, it's not about being religious or non-religious. It's about being a seeker or a joiner. And in previous eras, there was it was social requirements about being a joiner, right? So that's the first thing I would say. The second thing that I would say is, uh, um, it's here's what concerns me about this. It does not concern me for people's souls. God is far wider and far more merciful and far more wise than me, and you know I will let God worry about people's souls. It doesn't particularly concern me about people's morality. All of us have met religious jerks, right? Uh, and all of us have met deeply uh, humane and merciful secular humanists or atheists or whatever it might be, right? And if you haven't, you got to get out more, you know, seriously. Um, uh, I do think. I, I have a personal bias towards commitments. I think commitments are a good thing. I think it's good for human beings to have commitments. Uh, I think it's you know good to have marital commitments are good. Commitments to children and parents are good. Commitments to uh, nations and traditions are good. Part of that is sociological. I think you can show the good that results from those things as far as the cohesion of a society. Part of that is because you know honestly, like deep inside, I'm kind of a traditionalist. I'm kind of conservative in that way kind of a bias of mine. 
that I just think it's a good thing. But here's what concerns me. So the morality stuff doesn't concern me necessarily. The, um, uh, the where people's souls go doesn't concern me. So the, the thing that concerns me is just, it's very sociological. It's American social capital, right? How are these Catholic hospitals supported? When 500 people show up in the pews on a Sunday morning and put 10 bucks in the till, right? So when that number falls to 400, 300, 200, it's just not that much money in the till. And that, that deeply concerns me, right? It deeply concerns me that the erosion of religious belonging is going to lead to the erosion of American social capital in ways that I think are honestly uh, obvious, but it's, it is not part of the discussion. People, people aren't talking about it. I'll tell you what will happen uh, that replaces that is big ticket philanthropy. Right, so, the, so, so whereas once the Catholic hospital was supported by uh, 5,000 Catholics in the city, each giving what they could, now the Catholic hospital is going to be underwritten by five wealthy families. And if the CEO of that hospital isn't a hustler, it's going to die. Right, so the CEO has to, has to, become, uh, uh, has to become a hustler, has to become a, a fundraising hustler. So I think we're going to, we're going to I, mean, I don't know where this is going to go uh, in the next 30, 40, 50 years, but that, that's the part of it that concerns me. I've never thought of myself as a fundraising hustler. That's exactly you what you are. You may have a point. Uh, <laughs> a couple of things briefly, I think, have contributed to this uh, massive change. Sociologists begin to describe uh, no longer three stages of a growing up, which would be uh, infancy, adolescence, adulthood. They've inserted a, uh, a step between the second and the fourth, third, which makes now the fourth. So it's now infancy, adolescence, emerging adulthood, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and adulthood. Mm -hmm. This means, among other things, if you go back 50, 60 years, it wasn't that odd that someone would get married at 18. You make life choices. You do that. Now, people would say, well, you don't know what you're doing. You better go to college first. So what happens if beforehand you operate in pretty much a cohesive community of Catholics or of Jews or others, and you continue that through grade school and high school, you stay in the neighborhood, you marry someone in that culture, it all kind of holds together. Think mm -hmm. of your grandparents, okay? That's probably pretty much the case. There are exceptions to this. My mom and dad were exceptions to it, all right. But by and large, that was the way it went. Now. People go to college. Colleges are big mixing bowls. There are a lot of different things. You meet all kinds of people. You start dating people that are quite different. And this is what unfolds. So no surprise there. Second thing happens. There are a lot of ways in which, I think Ibu was right about this, the kind of institutions that at one time had a certain grip, and it was understood if you weren't part of it, you, you sin. You, you better go. That is no, that's no longer there. That's no longer there. If you, if you don't go to church on Sunday for a Catholic, that used to be a big no-no. You're in trouble. Now it's, well, you know, I just didn't go. No big thing. That sort of thing. And that's unfortunate. But the other side of the coin is it requires a person who before was supported by a kind of social structure to have a personal commitment. Mm -hmm. And if you don't acquire a personal commitment to that tradition and some knowledge of it, and this is what bothers me most, is that when you leave your religious education to the media, <laughs> you're not only going to be misled, all you will see are huge controversies. And some of the great richness of the various Christian traditions, Jewish tradition, it's just not there. You might get a really sensitive exposure to the journey of faith and so on in a movie like Philomena. It's a very interesting movie. But by and large, you watch most movies if religion is at all there, it's probably part of the problem. So there's signals sent out. And too many of our religious traditions contribute to that. So somebody says that we have a lot of spiritual but not religious people today because there are a lot of religious people who are not spiritual. <laughs> so that's one of the challenges we have to face as well. Great. So now I'm going to ask uh, for questions uh, from the audience. I know this is an event about religion, but I'll ask for questions, not sermons. Um, and if you're going to um, ask a question, I ask that you stand um, and speak loudly so we can 
uh, someone will come around with a microphone so we can get you on video. So who wants to start us off this evening? Yes, the woman up front. So. Um, I lived in Europe before, during, and after 9-11, and I felt paranoia. I think a lot of people throughout the world did. And I had a driver who was a Muslim, and he was asking me questions, and I was talking about my religion and how I was a fairly recent convert to Catholicism. And he told me that his wife was Catholic. And I said, how do you two get along? And he said, well, we have Mother Mary in common. And that was one of the rare occasions that I ever heard about that connection. And I'm wondering if you could illuminate that or verify that or what you know about that. And if that might be a driving force behind a connection between Muslims and Catholics. Right. What a great question. I, if I'm correct, Mary is the, is the only woman named in the Quran. And the Muslim view of Mary is actually very similar to the Christian view of Mary, which is a Virgin Mary who, who the angel Gabriel brings her Jesus. Right? And, and uh, uh, it, it is said that when the Prophet Muhammad, when he returns to Mecca uh, and he destroys the idols, like Abraham did, the one idol he doesn't destroy, he cradles in his arm is the idol of Mary, the statue of Mary holding the baby Jesus. This is all to say that Mary is deeply, deeply, deeply revered in Islam. Um, yeah, let's go to the back right, uh, Adil, and then we'll come back over here. Thank you very much. Uh, my question has to do with um, people who are what I call damnationists. So people who believe that their way is the only way to get to heaven, or that there is a way to get to heaven, and uh, people who fall outside that way are not going to heaven. Is there a place for them at the interfaith table? And how do we incorporate those people to our interfaith conversations? A great question. Uh, I think it's a question about uh, fundamentalists who believe it's my way or the highway. The problem I've always found is uh, many of them are not interested in coming to the table. I mean, if you have it, um, there's no need to learn anything from anybody else. You just present it. So I think that's a real difficult problem. The other side of the coin I tried to talk about earlier, and that is, for those who, like myself, believe that there is an authentic, full revelation of who God is in Jesus, how do I also make genuine room for people of other faiths in a saving and graceful way? Not as condescending, but as somehow God talking through a variety of religions. Remember, Vatican II made a very bold statement, and that is that Catholics should revere and respect everything that is good and holy, mm -hmm. holy in other religions. So, so um, I, I don't think the issue is about people's beliefs. I think the issue is about people's language and actions, right? So I just assume that when I have an encounter with people who orient around religion differently, they think that their religion is better than mine. And if they didn't, I'd be like, what the heck do you think? Yeah. What are you doing, <laughs> right? Yeah. And that part of that, I describe it when people say, do you think your religion is better than mine? I say, I believe that Islam has the fullness of the truth, yeah. right? And I believe that there is, in, in very similar as Vatican II language, right? Deep truth and holiness in a range of traditions. And that's Quranic, right? God sent a teacher to all peoples, right? And it's, there's the 124,000 is the number actually used. The point that I'm making is, it's, I simply assume that there are people around the table who don't think I'm going to the same place after we die that they are. I mean, that's America, right? Uh, that, that's actually like mainline theology in, in a range of traditions. I, I don't think that that should offend us. I think that what should, the problem is when people can only talk about that. Right? And so the question that I ask at that point is, is it possible for us to have a conversation about something other than eschatology? 
Is it possible for us to have uh, focus on something different, right? So I think that this is, I, I, if it would be very sad to me to think that the only people I'm in the room with are the ones who think we're all going to heaven. I'll tell you why, because that's a particular theology. That's not a better theology, that's just a theology. There's all kinds of other theologies out there, right? And if I'm in an interfaith conversation, I would like to, there to be present people who share those other theologies under some basic set of ground rules, which says, generally speaking, we are going to attempt to find points of positive, mutually enriching contact. That doesn't mean we're gonna, it's gonna be like, you wash your hands, I wash my hands, awesome. Right? <laughs> it's more like, tell me, tell me your understanding of mercy from your tradition, and I'll tell you mine. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not, you think I'm going to hell? Right? Fighting time. The, 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 uh, it, the last thing I'll say about this is, is, I am unclear why it bothers people when other people think they are not going to heaven. Why do you care what they think about heaven? They don't control it. You don't control it either, by the way. You know? So why, why do you, why, why should any of us care what anybody else thinks about where we're going after we die? That's like somebody telling me their favorite color. I'm like, great. You know, interesting fact. But you don't control heaven or hell, so I am not going to allow you to make me feel a particular way because of what you think about that. I would much prefer to have a conversation about something that we find mutually enriching. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, we'll say one. Um, good evening. Thank you very much for all the words that you've shared already. Um, something that I've run into, as was alluded to, um, I'm actually studying interfaith broadly in higher education. And, and it's funny because normally uh, there's this, into, people get the intellectual approach to religions and uh, religions or the study of it, and many people get the kind of heart, heart of, of belief. And what I run into is, um, uh, particularly with some faculty, they, when you say interfaith skills or learning about the other, from an intellectual way, they, they completely get that. They say, okay, we need to be prepared for a diverse world. But um, I love that you alluded to this normative um, uh, approach, which I think, personally, as a person who, who enjoys interfaith, I think it would be a good thing to get people to be more open. Um, but there's this conflict between quote unquote head, and, uh, you know, being okay with head approaches and being very suspicious of heart approaches. And myself, I, I, in both studying and my own personal life, I seem very much interweave my, my head approach to interfaith and my heart approach to interfaith. Um, so can you share either personally or professionally or, or in your own studies how you have reconciled or how you deal with those that are, that are suspicious of, of this kind of interaction between the head and the heart? Uh, two brief things. One is, um, I love the biblical image of the heart. And the heart is located midway between the head and the gut. And that means if you only go with the head, you get cold analysis. If you go with the gut, you can have blind passion. But if you go with the heart, you bring together the brain and the gut. Another way to say it is that the great teaching of Jesus is love the Lord your God with your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole soul. Heart, mind, soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now you can noodle about that a great deal, but at the core of it is love, but not blind love. It's head, heart, and gut. I'm gonna do some cold analysis for a second here. Um, so I think for Interfaith to take off in the academy, at least the way I'm imagining it, there has to be a dimension of the work that frankly is like, operates like public health, right? It has a clear goal of what it's about and it's able to measure that. And I, I, this is not that hard. Sociologists measure attitudes all the time. So the goal of this particular interfaith program is to improve the attitudes of the participants towards these five religions. You can set out that goal and you can measure that goal, right? We know from, uh, from sociology on religious diversity 
that if you have a positive, meaningful relationship with somebody from another religion, your attitudes towards that tradition and community improve. So the methodology of this interfaith program is to facilitate positive, meaningful relationships through this service activity or this arts project. At the end of the program, we are going to ask participants to write about the three new meaningful positive relationships they had. And then we're going to program three follow-ups with that. Right? Now this isn't all of interfaith work. Right? Mm -hmm. I think that there's, a, there's theology, there's comparative religion, there's all this kind of stuff. But this is what I would call the public health dimension of interfaith work. And honestly, to be really blunt about it, it's done very poorly. Okay, here's my analogy for this. If you were to walk, it's, it's as if you were to walk by a public health clinic and say, hey, what disease are you trying to address? And they were like, well, could be malaria, could be AIDS, we're not really sure, but we're out here doing something good, right? Well, actually, you know, condoms aren't gonna help you that much with malaria, right? So there are methodologies and strategies that are useful in particular settings and, and for particular goals and not for others. Right? So I think interfaith is the same way. If the purpose, I think there could be 10 or 12 or 15 various goals for an interfaith program, but an interfaith program can't accomplish all of them at the same time. If, if this is going to become a rigorous programmatic field, a la education, right? imagine you know, somebody, not, somebody teaching your kid to read for five years and never administering a literacy exam. Right? If it's going to become like public health or education or environmentalism, which I hope that it does, it's going to have to, it's going to, have to be much clearer for that dimension of the work about its goals and about how to measure them and what is an effective interfaith program and what's not. And honestly, being in this field for 15 years, the word effectiveness has, I, I can count the number of times it's come up on one hand. Uh, yes, let's. Uh, the gentleman here uh, in the way, sure. Um, okay, and we'll, we'll, we'll so, and then we'll go back to you. Um, so a few months ago, I saw like some YouTube videos. It was done by the, like, the Archdiocese of Rochester, and they seem to be like working on some interfaith dialogue between Catholics, uh, Muslims, and Jews. Um, and I was kind of interested in that, and thought it would be nice to see that kind of dialogue happening in other, you know, parishes and other dioceses. Um, and I was, and then, you know, I heard Father Jim what you were saying about having your faith rooted deep within, in, in order to take different, you know, uh, different faith traditions. And I was wondering, so if a person is interested in maybe having this kind of inter-faith uh, dialogue, um, should he, should he be kind of focusing first on trying to get like their own religion a little figured out more. I mean, it's hard to get a like, Catholic to read the Bible, so, um, <laughs> like, what, what would you, what would you, what would you say to that? <laughs> I, I don't know much about my religion, I guess, either, um, and, you know, uh, like I was telling you earlier, I was at a mosque trying to have a conversation with a, a, a Muslim, and I found it very interesting, but at the same time, again, like, I don't feel like I know my religion enough to... Well, I've had a number of students say to me that I, I, I never understood my faith until I started dating someone who's not of my faith, and, mm -hmm. and he or she kept asking me these questions, and then I had to really dig. And <laughs> you know, I, I think it's if, if the desire is genuine, namely to root oneself and at the same time to be open, they're simultaneous. It, it, it constantly goes back and forth. But you need good teachers. You need people who help to facilitate that. Otherwise, uh, it's, it's really easy to gum it up. Um, so I would say both happen, and they often happen best in that interaction about who you really are. And, and you, you learn it by talking with someone who thinks otherwise and raises questions for you. And if you're a USC student, come to the Interfaith Council Tuesday, 6 p.m. <laughs> you can talk to Sable. So that's a good place to start. Yes, um, I know you've been waiting patiently, so... Right, right here, yeah. Thank you both for your generous and kind words about this uh, topic. I wonder, in your talking about sort of coming into spaces where 
we realize that our faith has something that's maybe not exclusive, but certainly central that we want to share, but that we don't want to sort of convert other people necessarily. Uh, but then we want to encounter people who have difference. We want to know ourselves and we want to encounter our others. In that tension, in that comfort with that tension, I wonder if there's, I wonder if you guys could comment on the strains of postmodernism that, that stretch into that? Do you see any, or is it not relevant? Postmodernism. Uh, how can I do this simply? Uh, postmodernism tends to stress um, the particularity of one standpoint affects what one knows, sometimes gender, sometimes race, sometimes any number of things. But what it says in essence is it's hard to make a big generalization. You know, some of the least thoughtful postmodernists said there can be no meta narrative, mm -hmm. which is a meta narrative. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So right. you get yourself in a contradiction. But, but I, I, I would suggest that um, there is a good side to this whole trend of postmodernism. It makes people aware of certain limitations of their claims. The problem with postmodernism is if it would ever cancel out uh, a truth to such an extent that all it is is a matter of your projection. So I think you gotta find mm -hmm. a middle ground there. And you know, I mean, universities exist to try to educate people so they're not as much suckers. You know, I mean, <laughs> they learn something and that's why you go to school. And we teach some stuff and every professor I know that believes in his or her discipline is gonna try to present something that is beyond simply opinion, all right? There'll be opinions too, but that, that's important. Otherwise, I think we end up with uh, nothing, chaos. Yes. Um, uh, we'll do the gentleman in the back and then. Uh, Mr. Patel, you had started out with talking about uh, the attempt to establish Granola House by ground zero. And what I'm wondering is, um, you know, religious communities have to uh, figure out not only uh, kind of religious space in the American context, but also social space. And were the people who tried to, the, the, the Muslim community that tried to establish Cordoba House, were they um, strategically um, in error in, in terms of letting go of the project? Um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a question yeah. of how well, they not show civic respect, so to speak. Right, and, yeah. and I'd be interested in, in Jim's response to this too because there were uh, Catholics who spoke up for the project, but there was also a lot of ambivalence and silence on the part of the Catholic community in New York as well as nationally. So I, I'm interested in, here's a concrete example of how uh, one is welcoming to uh, new religious communities trying to establish itself but the religious community itself also having to uh, think strategically about um, you know, uh, setting its roots and establishing itself. Yeah. I think I thank you for that question and thank you for asking it gently and generously. So this is actually this is what sacred ground is about, right? So like like the first third of the book is on this. So just a couple of things, and this comes straight out of the book. Um, uh, there was a front page New York Times article on Cordova House in December of 2009. So two million people read the New York Times a day and there was not a big kerfuffle about it then. Two months later, Daisy Khan, who was one of the leaders involved, went on Fox News and spoke about it to, I think, Dr. Laura, one of the Lauras who's uh, an anchor on Fox News. And she says at the end, this sounds great, I, don't, I can't see anything wrong with it, right? It wasn't until May when a, a kind of a flamethrowing right wing blogger uh, uh, on her blog says victory mosque at ground zero that it starts to take off mm -hmm. so what's interesting about all of this is that it's not the fact of the project it's a particular framing and, and the term victory mosque at ground zero migrates to the front page of the New York Post the next day and then we're off and running right and then, then you have then you have a frame called oh my gosh these these uh, co colleagues in cahoots with the terrorists want to build um, want to build a monument to their destruction. But six months earlier, when it was described both on Fox News and in the New York Times as basically a Muslim civic pro a, a civic project with a swimming pool. I mean, I'll tell you what I was I was afraid of. It it was started by a very liberal group of Muslims, and you know, we Muslims are uh, 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 we are 
we don't do swimming pools, let us just say. <laughs> and I was, when, I, when I saw that Imam Faisal and Daisy, for gender reasons, right? Uh, um, and especially because this wasn't supposed to be just a Muslim space in which you can like, you know, men swim from nine to noon and women from noon to five or whatever. It was meant to be open. And so it would have to be uh, consistent with the culture of lower Manhattan, right? Um, uh, I, 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 I read that in the New York Times and I rolled my eyes and I thought to myself, my gosh, Imam Faisal is going to just be, he's going to be taken out by even moderate Muslims or, you know, or relatively traditional Muslims. My big fear was the swimming pool, right? Because there was no kerfuffle. So it wasn't until that other framing and it wasn't until a set of politicians on the make decide to kind of jump on that bandwagon that it becomes... A big deal. Having said that, I think that they made a ton of mistakes over the course of the summer. The, the main one was that Imam Faisal was abroad on a State Department trip representing America in all these Muslim countries, and so he couldn't go on CNN and, you know, and explain the project. Just a very brief thing, uh, because I know it's getting late. Um, there was a Catholic version of this in the 1990s, early 1990s, and that's when a group of contemplative nuns wanted to establish a convent at a concentration camp. And it was the spirit of repentance and so on and so forth. But the Jews found this offensive. And eventually, with the intervention of John Paul II, they pulled out. So it's one thing to talk about religious freedom in principle. It's another thing to work at the local level to prepare the ground so that yeah. it can be understood. Uh, let me just add, this all happened during an election year, and it became politicized as an election issue. And then after the election, we didn't hear anything about it. And then it opened without any fanfare. So I think timing played a role in how it was framed, and, um, and, and especially because it was happening. The in candidates in Nevada were running at this. I'm like, what, the, what do you have to do with Lower Manhattan? You know? One more question. Uh, I know we're running out of time, so let's just do one more question, and we'll wrap it up. Uh, and so who wants to, uh, maybe we can... Elaine, do you have a question? We'll end with a student. Um, and uh, Elaine, uh, who is uh, part of our Interfaith Council, a student leader here at the Catholic Center and just attended the Interfaith Youth Corps Institute, Interfaith Inter Institute, uh, Leadership Institute at SC this weekend. So why don't you close us out? For Hi, my name's Elaine, and I'm a student here at USC, and I'm also from a small town in the Midwest. And um, I'm from a town like that, which is described by like it's really internal. It's nicknamed the Catholic Corner because we have a monastery, Abbey, high school, and college on the same block. <laughs> um, but honestly, the first time I ever met a Jew, Muslim, or Hindu was when I came to USC. And that's when I became really active in interfaith studies um, because, like you said, when people have relationships with people of other faiths, they're more likely to think positively. My question is how do you bring interfaith work and interfaith activism to small towns like mine where it's there are no Muslims and there are no Jews, and people have to go out of their way to meet people of other faiths. How do you motivate them um, and convey the importance of interfaith work? So, great question. So, if you were to walk down Main Street in your small town and tap random citizen Henry on the shoulder and say, Tell me, do you have an image of what a Muslim is like? Would they have an image? They would have, they would have the image that the media presents. Right, they've heard stories. Right? So I think the only, the only alternative is you've got to be a storyteller. Right? So, so the, the only, the, you know, Peter Berger, the great modernity theorist, says that, that the chief characteristic of high modernity is interaction with people from different backgrounds. And that interaction happens through the flows of globalization, through global cities, through uh, immigration, through travel, but most profoundly through mass communications. Right? So what's, what's interesting to me is, is people, there's very few caves that you can hide in in the world. And I don't think there's any cave in America that you can hide in unless you're the Amish. Right? I mean that with great respect, like unless you deliberately build a bubble in which you will not encounter stories of other people. The challenge, as Father had said earlier, is those stories are going to be sensational and twisted. I think one of the things that interfaith leaders do is they're able to tell humanizing stories, right? So when you go back to your small, like literally think to yourself, what six stories would I tell? Not with any self-righteousness, not with any let me show you, right? But just a sense of knowing that 
this way of telling this story will create a different archetype of a Muslim or a Jew or a Hindu. Telling, talking about Varun's influence on you, right? Um, in a set of terms that they will understand. Then when I show up in that town and tap Citizen Henry on the shoulder and say, do you have an image of a Muslim? Their image will be Varun, right? Not whatever madness is happening on the evening news. The only thing I would add is uh, education of the clergy, education of mm -hmm. teachers. Well, I want to thank all of you for being here for this extraordinary conversation about the future of faith. Uh, it's of critical importance that we continue these conversations. I'm so grateful to our uh, rock star panelists here, a national interfaith leader, Dr. Ibu Patel. Uh, And of course, uh, Professor and Father James Heft. So, I encourage you all to stick around and purchase a copy of uh, Sacred Ground. I'm sure Ibu will uh, personalize it for you. But before we adjourn this evening, I just want to hand it back over to Gary for a few quick announcements. Thank you. Uh, let's thank our rock star. One of my favorite lines from the evening, thank you to all three of you, uh, thanks to all three of you for helping us not be suckers. <laughs> uh, we look forward to seeing you again April 8th. We have a, um, an evening on neuroscience and the soul with neuroscientist Ken Miller from Brown, um, who will be out here with us for the evening. Check our website for it. Uh, and also, please head over to the book table and make sure you give your thanks to our speakers. It was great seeing you. Drive safely.